Well, hey, church, welcome, and happy Mother's Day wherever you're joining us from today, in person, online, on television, or from one of the hundreds of prisons that are tuned in right now from all across the nation. We honor you. And today is a day that we show honor to all of the incredible women in our lives, moms and moms-to-be, those who have children, those who don't. I know that days like today can be difficult for many of you, particularly for those who perhaps you've desired children of your own and maybe you don't have children of your own. Maybe you've lost a mother today can be bittersweet for you. What we want you to know is that you are loved, you are valued, and you are highly favored of the Lord. And so to our wives and daughters and granddaughters, to our sisters and mothers and grandmothers, to all of our female friends and companions and coworkers and classmates, come on church, we honor you. Would you honor all the incredible women in this church and watching from afar? Isaiah chapter 66, verse 13 says this. This is the word of the Lord. God says, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. I want you to think about this. What an incredible promise by God for all of us that God himself, first of all, would compare himself in his own words to a mother, his love to a mother's love, his heart to a mother's heart. Tells us a lot about God, says a lot about the power of a mother's love. Today, as we conclude our series, Greatest of All Time, we have long planned to end this series with a teaching on the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And sometimes the greatest teacher in life is life itself. The story you're about to hear today will challenge you, inspire you, and I hope will teach you what the love of God really looks like. In this story, you will hear of the unconditional love of God at work, perhaps in a way you've never heard or seen before. You'll hear of a son's love for his mother, a mother's unconditional love for her son, and a daughter's act of love and forgiveness that church, I promise you, it will literally cut you to the core. It was a personal encounter with Jesus at the age of 30, that changed the trajectory of Stanley Stever's life forever. Though some might say it was a decision that Stanley made at the age of 17 that was the most defining. When in 1987, at just 17 years of age, Stanley was arrested, charged, and convicted for the murder of 56-year-old Stella Heck. Stanley would spend the next 33 years in prison and behind bars from the age of 17 to 51. While in prison, he joined the Aryans, a neo-Nazi white supremacist gang, very quickly became one of this notorious gang's highest ranking and most violent members within his prison. Not quite the introduction you might expect of a man that I would submit to you looks today more like Jesus than maybe any man I've ever met. A kind-hearted man, a man who has now for more than 21 years dedicated his life to following Jesus and to loving people the way Jesus loves people. Not a perfect man, nobody's perfect, but a a Christ-like man. A man perhaps who might be best compared to the Apostle Paul, who in his own words in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse nine, he said this, I am the least of all the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. You see, before following Jesus, before becoming one of the greatest missionaries, church planters ever to live, before having written nearly half of the New Testament, the apostle Paul was known as Saul, and Saul was a murderer. He had blood on his hands. The apostle Paul had a past, as we all have a past. And yet he also had an incredible encounter with Jesus that changes everything. So church, let me challenge you with this. If you believe in grace, if you believe in the power of forgiveness and in reconciliation, if you believe in the power of God and in the transforming power of his Holy Spirit, and that God can take a cold-hearted man like Saul and turn him into a kind-hearted, kingdom-minded leader like the Apostle Paul, you'll lean in today. 
And you'll likely see yourself in this story, somewhere in this story. And you will join me in welcoming my friend and a dear and beloved member of this church, Stan Stever. Come on, somebody. Stan. Wow. Wow. Stan, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your story with us, for being willing to to share your story. I, I want you to know that the more time I spend with you, every time I spend any time with you, I walk away just wrecked. I walk away encouraged and inspired, and I want you to know that it is an honor to share this platform with you today. You were incarcerated at the age of 17. Yeah. But I want to start a bit before that. What was life like for you before prison? What was your family like? Where did you grow up? What was life like for you as a child? I think the first thing I I really want to everybody to know is I wasn't born a murderer. I wasn't brought into this life and that was my way. Um, I didn't wake up one day thinking, you know, today I'm going to become a murderer. That wasn't who I was. Uh, I grew up, I was the youngest of eight. I have six sisters and a brother. Grew up in a small farm community in Sycamore, Ohio. It was, it was easy. It was fun life at first. Uh, but then stuff, life, the world started happening. Was never introduced to Jesus as a kid. You know, church wasn't part of our family. The farm was the family. And so growing up on the farm, growing up in that life, I um, was kind of secluded, uh, wasn't around a lot, uh, started going to school, and it was about the third grade that uh, life changed, uh, started getting bullied, started getting, being called names, being just badgered day after day after day after day. And I didn't know, and this was the 70s. So I didn't know about counseling. I didn't know about bullying. All that stuff wasn't really talked about. So the the stuff that was going inside of me, that was going on inside of my head and inside of my body, I didn't know what it was. So I didn't know how to deal with it. So this anger and this rage just kept building. And man, my first act of violence was in the seventh grade. Uh, for no reason whatsoever, I walked up to a kid and I punched him in his face. And, uh, and I, I was in trouble. I got in trouble, got expelled. Uh, but growing up in that community and having that going on and no kind of outlet of it, uh, and nothing else but bad could have came of it. I know of your parents, you said you had loving parents. They were yeah. good parents. Um, they did. They worked a lot, so they weren't they weren't present right. often. And um, were you disciplined as a child? Was there a disciplinary in your home? No, uh, my father was disciplined really harsh as a child, so he didn't want to discipline me. So in growing up, I would do something wrong. My mom would want to discipline me, but my dad would say, "No, boys will be boys." And so, yeah, I was never disciplined as a child, no. So at 17 years old, you're charged with murder. You're committed to an adult prison. What, what were you feeling then? What were those first <laughs> few days, months, years like as a 17-year-old child mm. being admitted into a man's world, a, an adult prison? Yeah. Man. The only thing at 17 that was an adult was my size. You know, I... I I sprouted as a child at, at 11, 10, 11 years old. I was 6'1", 220 pounds. So going into prison, I was 6'1", 280 pounds. But that was the only adult part of me. My mind, my life experience, nothing else was adult. So going in there, I was scared to death. I mean, the only thing that comes close to 
me explaining how the, the fear that was in me is if you've ever been in a car accident and you see it coming, but there's nothing you can do about it in that, that helplessness feeling, that was the fear that I had for a whole year, if not more. So the fear was uncontrollable. The hopelessness was, was unbearable. Uh, there was no place to hide. Uh, you go into prison and there was more people in that prison than in the hometown that I grew up in. So trying to get away from everybody, trying to get out of that, it, it didn't work. Uh, I was in a dormitory with about 120 guys. Um, and had I had no idea what to do. Uh, being from a small town, I didn't have any, you know, homies or, or people that I grew up with or people that I knew. Um, so I was lost. And, uh, and it was in that that a lot of stuff happened that would cause a, um, a distance in me and would cause me to go in a way that I had no idea I could go that way. And as a, an underage young man, you stood out not just because of your age, yeah. but talk about the, the way that they would... <laughs> Sort of single you so, out in a way. Yeah. So when, you, when, when then, when you went into prison, you would get a prison ID, and on the prison ID, they would have a big red dot on the ID. And the only reason for the red dot, there was two reasons. One, you would get whole milk because you were still a teenager. <laughs> and two, it was a bullseye. Uh, every deprived, um, evil, messed up person in that prison knew you were a young kid and they would pray on you and they prayed on me. And it was in that that I, I was incarcerated in that prison for a week or maybe less and um, was sexually sexually assaulted, and uh, I fought back. I knew how to fight. I grew up fighting, so, I mean, that was easy for me. Uh, I ended up uh, getting him on the ground, and, and, and I literally tried to take his life. Um, I wasn't an easy prey, so it only happened a few times, but it happened a few times. Within the first few weeks of being in prison too, you had shared with me that you, you saw a man take another man's life as well. That was your introduction into yeah. prison. So you're seeing the violence, you're experiencing the violence, you have a target on your back. You, you joined the Aryans, right, which is a, which is a neo-Nazi white supremacist yeah. gang organization. I, was there already an existing hatred in your heart towards black people, non-white people, or was that affiliation something that was more a matter of survival for you? How do you explain that? So growing up in that small town, I wasn't around any other races. I wasn't around Hispanics, African-Americans, Orient. I wasn't around, it was all white. I didn't know racism. I didn't, had never experienced it. Um, but those first, that first year of incarceration, every time something bad happened to me, it was of another race that was doing it to me. And every time it would happen, I'd go, I'd sit on my bed after fighting, after struggling, after all of that. And there was a white guy that slept right behind me and said, uh, you know, it's going to keep happening. It's going to keep happening. You need to get with your own to make this stop happening. So that was really my first introduction to uh, a racial divide, a racial thinking. And every word he said in my heart and in my mind, I thought was true. So it was an easy introduction to that life. Uh, it wasn't long after that, that, uh, man, I would, I would fight. I would 
earn my bones, what they call, and I would raise up in, in, in the, what, they, what they say is a ranks within the, within the Aryans. So you, you were an asset to that gang because yeah. you knew how to fight. They also use the Bible yeah. um, as justification for their hatred toward non-white yeah. people. You had a mentor that really took you under his wing. Tell us about that relationship. So I, I, was, I was probably running things, assisting running things in the prison for a couple years, and then this guy came in. Um, they called him Shorty Hitler. Uh, so you can imagine the hatred that it was in his heart, uh, the fear that, that he was able to uh, give people. Uh, I call him JB. Uh, he, uh, he became a father figure. My father died a year after I was incarcerated. So I, I had no real male role models in my life. I had no guidance of leadership. And so I, I was drawn to him. I was drawn to him and I mean, he would walk in a room and you could see the respect, the fear, the feared respect that he had. And when you looked into his eyes, you saw the volcanoes, you saw the anger, and you knew he was dangerous. And that's what I wanted. I wanted people to fear me. I wanted people not to be able to, to hurt me anymore. I, th I think it's interesting, um, as we were talking about JB um, and, and his becoming a father role model to you, one of the things that you shared with me a few weeks ago is that he would discipline you <laughs> like a father maybe should, but he took it uh, a little even, harsher, even a yeah. little bit beyond that. And there, there were times in your, your young life where you said that you would do things just to try to get somebody to kill you yeah, because you'd lost all sense of living. And a person yeah. who's lost all sense of living is the most dangerous person on the planet. But then something happens. I want to fast forward just a bit. So okay. you've You've, you've joined the Aryans, you've, you've become sort of like a, a sergeant at arms or lieutenant, you're, you're, you're making sure guys are getting paid, you're, you're very yeah. much uh, a part of that, that organization, you're, you hate just about everybody, yeah. um, and you're pretty sure prison will be your life forever. Yeah. At 30 years old, your mentor, Shorty Hitler, gets saved in prison. <laughs> I mean, he gets... He gets like bonafide saved, right? He leaves the Aryans, which it's supposed to be blood in, blood out. Yeah. So you're ready for blood. You're, yeah. you're looking for blood. You've turned your yeah. back on him. You've disavowed him um, because he's, in a sense, disavowed you. Yeah. And you get word from somebody in the Aryans calling the shots much higher than you from another prison that you are not to lay your hand on somebody that God is is on, right? So right. this is confusing to you because right. it's supposed to be blood yeah. and blood out. You, you're not yeah. supposed to touch Shorty. God's apparently protecting Shorty from Stan, right? So you wind up back in the hole. You're in solitary confinement. You're dealing with all of this, these emotions. They bring you out to meet your mother. And this kickstarts a pretty important season in your life. What, what happens when you meet your mother? Yeah, so back in the hole in solitary confinement, you're by yourself. Um, back there, I hadn't seen my mother in, I'm not even sure how long. It, it had been a couple years. Um, she would go in and out. Uh, she was there the whole time, uh, would write me, would send me some money, but um, I would find out later that she was scared of me. That's why she stayed away. So they came and got me out of the, the hole. Uh, while you're in solitary confinement in the hole, when you come out on a visit, you have a belly chain and you're handcuffed. So you're in an orange jumpsuit, belly chain, handcuffs. So there's nothing you can do. You're, you're pretty much harmless. You, and I, I walk out and I look at my mom and I see a tear coming down her eyes. And, and it's kind of confusing because she has seen me in this way I, I, for the first so many years, I lived in the hole. Because you've so, been in prison at this point about 13 years. 13 years. years. Yeah. And so this wasn't the first time she had seen me in the hole. So I get kind of angry and, and I'm like, mom, it's fine. 
I'm okay. These people can't break me. I'm good. I can do this stuff standing on my head. This stuff is nothing, mom. Don't cry. And she just kind of shakes her head. And she, man, she said something that would cut my heart. And, uh, and I would not let on. She said, Stanley, when are you going to grow up? And I said, mom, what do you mean? I'm 30 years old doing life in prison in one of the most notorious gangs in the world. What do you mean I'm not grown up? She said, Stanley, you're doing the exact same thing you were doing when you were 13 years old. So how are you grown? And I didn't want her to see how much it hurt. I didn't want her to to see the, the change in me because at that point, you hid your emotions very well in prison. So I sat down and changed the subject and I was out there maybe an hour and I'm like, all right, mom, I'm done. And I go back and uh, man, I sit back in solitary and, and uh, man, the, the JB leaving the gang, coming to a, a God that I had no idea who he was and, and mom saying that to me. And, and, and I, in my heart, I'm like, why am I so confused? This is a simple life. You survive. I didn't know there was anything else. I didn't know there was more to it than that. And it was in that, that I think the change started happening, that, that God would pierce me. He would put me on my knees on the road to Damascus and, and, uh, and say to me that I got you. That's powerful. You know, you, in, in the whole, you would think about those words your mom spoke to you, when are you going to grow up? And, and you had shared with me that you started to, to realize that everything you were doing at 30, you were doing at 13, this, it was the same rebellion, it was yeah. the same anger, it was drugs, the same violence, everything. it was the same drugs. So you get invited to the same weekend that introduced your Aryan brother, racist, violent mentor <clears throat> to Jesus, right? You don't wanna go, but JB is pushing hard for you to go. The warden, your warden, for, for 10 years she was your warden, um, a warden, your warden who's here today, Ms. Money yeah. is here today. So come on, church. Mm -hmm. let's, let's give it up for Ms. Money. Mm -hmm. She's here today. <laughs> um, and Stan, you might not be here today if it's not for Ms. <laughs> Money. So Ms. Money, Ms. Money calls you and personally invites you and, and goes even a step beyond that. She personally sponsors you so that you can participate in this Christian weekend, this weekend that's meant to introduce uh, men like you to, to, yeah. to Jesus. Tell us about that encounter. What happens? It's, oh, man. So it's, uh, it's a program called Kairos. Mm. It's a four-day Christian retreat that they bring into prisons. And it's, I mean, down the hallway you hear about it, and all you hear about is the food and the Jesus cookies. <laughs> so that's the, I mean, that's the draw. You know, for guys in prison, you don't get a lot of good food, and you hear about good food, and you want to be part of it. Uh, so that's the draw, and you don't know the real food that you're getting ready to eat. Come on. And uh, that's, uh, so when I go, um, I go high uh, the first night. Uh, I smoke some weed. I go down there. I got the munchies. I eat a whole bunch of cookies. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I see some dudes that, you know, I, I don't know them. You know, they're not my, you know, kind of guys. I go back. I decide I don't want to go back. Um, JB asked me as I leave that night uh, whether I was going to go back and, or how it was. And I said, oh, I was good. Cookies were awesome. I said, I'm not going to go back. Um, it was after that that uh, I went back to my cell, um, went in my cell, shut the door, smoked another uh, joint, and uh, ate some more cookies. And uh, all of a sudden, I get called down to the officer's desk. And when you get called down to the officer's desk, there's usually one thing involved when you're someone like me is you're going to the hall. 
I go down there and they, they tell me there's a phone call on the, and I need to talk to them. And I'm like, no, I don't have a phone call on the officer's phone. I I'm not talking to anybody on the phone. And they said, it's a direct order. Well, I had, I had, you know, illegal stuff in my cell and I didn't want them to find that stuff. And I, if I went to the hole, they were going to find it. So I reluctantly picked up the phone and, and, and the warden, uh, said, I'm, I heard you, you're not going back. And this is nine o'clock at night after count. I'm, I'm confused at how she would even find out. And, and I said, yeah, it's, it's not something I really want to be a part of. And uh, she said, I, I, would, I would count it as a personal favor. And you know, I'm, I'm a convict at that point. I'm like, man, I can have a personal favor from the warden. Oh, Come that's on. nice. Yeah, hey. <laughs> <laughs> All convicts wants a personal favor from the warden. So uh, I... But, but you, in particular, really had a lot of hatred in your right, heart at that time right. towards her right. because you blamed the warden for essentially the Losing loss of... Losing my mentor. Your mentor, your, yeah. your, your, your second father. And you, you right. said that that was the first time that you actually shed a tear yeah. in prison uh, when you saw Shorty renounce the Aryans and yeah. say he yeah. found Jesus. So you, you blamed her for, for losing Absolutely. him. Absolutely. She t tells you hey, it's a personal favor. Would you go? So you, you go back. What, what happens? So when you leave at night, you get um, a bag of cookies, and in this bag of, it's a grocery bag, a brown grocery bag, and you have about six to eight dozen uh, in each bag, uh, and you leave each night. Well, Saturday night, they have a talk, and, and these are men from the outside that are, that are sharing their testimony, sharing their experiences that they've been through, and a brother by the name of... Uh, Randy Rich, who I count as a, a dear friend of mine today, he's a ex, uh, he's a retired Columbus SWAT officer. Uh, he gets up and he talks about forgiveness. And he talks about his father's life being taken. Uh, he was a deputy sheriff, um, pulled a guy over, uh, struggled with him on the side of a road. Uh, the guy took his gun from him and shot and killed him. And he talked about forgiving that guy that took his father's life. Chad, I didn't think I could ever be forgiven. When my dad died, it was at that point that I, the only scriptures you know as a heathen is the, is the ones that you can hold against people. You know, an eye for an eye. So I thought, God took my dad because I took a life. So I didn't know about forgiveness and hearing Randy's story and to think that I could be forgiven. Man, I, I wanted to, to try it. So that night they give you two bags of cookies. <laughs> so in that, uh, they... Uh, they said, you're going to, this extra bag of cookies, you need to give to someone that you have hatred in your heart for. Someone that you might need not forgive, but that there's, there's a, a deep-seated issue going on, and that hate needs to go someplace. So I had one person. His name was Jack. Um, he had done some, some things against one of our brothers, and I was supposed to deal with him that next week. And by deal, it, it was would, harm. It wouldn't have been very good. bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so that's the first name came to my first person came to my mind. I saw him in my face, in my eyes, in my mind. That was the face that came to me. So I walked down the hallway and I saw a guy going into the the dormitory that he was in, and I give the bag of cookies to him, and I say, hey, I need you to give this to Jack. And uh, the guy's like, oh, can I have a bag? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I said, this whole bag goes to Jack, and if not, 
I will be to see you. I'm not saved at that point, so I mean, it's, you know. <laughs> so uh, I just shake it off. I, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I mean, only God knows what's going on behind the scenes. So I go back next morning, Sunday morning. Uh, we go through the rest of the day, and we get to a part of it that's the graduation. At the graduation, when you walk in the, the chapel, you have everybody that has been through one of the weekends on one side that are in the in inside, the convicts, and you have the outside people on the other side. And when you come in, they're singing when the saints are mar uh, come marching in. Come and it is, it, it's unbelievable. You know, because you're on a mountaintop at that point. Uh, it was a half hour before that that I had accepted Jesus Christ into my life uh, because of prayer. <laughs> because of prayer and outside brothers that came in and shared Jesus with me, shared the love of God. Uh, Jim Driscoll led me to, led me to Christ. And um, so walking in that, in that, chapel. Uh, man, scripture comes alive for me. Uh, man, in the great cloud of witnesses, Come on. it was unbelievable. Uh, kind That's of, what it felt I don't like even know that I walked down the aisle. I think I floated down wow. the aisle. I uh, went up on stage. I sat down, I looked out and, you know, the front seats are always for the warden and, and, you know, the, the upper echelon of the management. And, and the next seats are the convicts on back. And I look out and I see Jack Quinn in the first seat right there looking at me. And I didn't know he had went through the weekend one weekend prior to mine. Wow. So he knew what that bag of cookies was. Come on. So. <laughs> <laughs> so all he could do was, what did I do? What did I do? Wow. Because he knew who I was. He knew the danger that I brought with me. He knew my capabilities. And all he kept saying was, what did I do? What did I do? And all I could say was, it's okay. It's okay. So you're saved <laughs> this weekend, 30 years old. You call your mom. Yeah. Tell us about that. So I go back after my graduation and uh, that was the first time in prison that I felt safe. It was the first time in prison that I felt something that I really had never felt, and I didn't even know how to explain it. I didn't know what to say about it, and I knew the very first person I wanted to share it with was my mom. So I call my mom, and, and uh, she answers. She's, she says, hello, and I said, Mom, I gotta share something with you. And she's like, what's wrong? <laughs> And I say, there's nothing wrong, Mom. There's nothing at all. I said, there's, there's something I went through this weekend that I want to share with you. I said, Mom, it was just so beautiful. It was so beautiful, Mom. And I want you to go through it. And there was a, there's a similar thing that's attached to Kairos, which is called Kairos Outside. And I said, I want you to go through it. I want you to go through this and experience this, what I experienced, mom. I said, mom, I'm different, mom. I've changed. <laughs> There's something different. I want you to experience this. So we, she went through her weekend and um, uh, there was a few ladies on that weekend that was instrumental. And her coming to Christ. 
Come on. One of those women, uh, two of the women are here. Uh, uh, Miss Shelby Fleck and uh, Christine Money. Wow. <clears throat> you know what I think is so amazing about what what even moved your mom to attend that that weekend retreat of her own is is that she told you. I've never heard my son call anything beautiful in his life. And that, that, was, that, was, that was enough for her to say, I need to go and see. Your mom is saved now. Yeah. She shares something with you yeah. about the day that you were sentenced that you never knew before. Tell us what that was. So she, she had started coming to visit me every week. Every time she got a chance, she started to come to visit uh, we start, I started sharing the word with her, and, and we just started growing. And uh, she said, Stanley, I want to share something with you that, um, that I haven't ever shared with you because I didn't know, even really know what it was at my, myself. She said, but I understand forgiveness now, and I want you to know about this. And she said, you know, the day that you were sentenced in court, Mrs. Heck's daughter was there. And Mrs. Heck's daughter came up to me and she said, Mrs. Stever, I, I, I just want you to know that I, f I forgive you, son. You'd been in prison more than 13 years, never knew that. I don't know that it would have uh, meant anything before. But God just kept showering stuff down. He kept showing me these things at times. <clears throat> you know, the enemy that he had stole from me. He stole all of this stuff from me. And, uh, and God just started giving this stuff back to me. And he started allowing me to feel and to understand more of, uh, man, more of the harm that I did. So I just started praying and I started praying his word and, and I started asking him, you know, God, your word tells me that, uh, that this is, we are part of a ministry of reconciliation. And that you have given us the ministry of reconciliation. So, Lord, I just pray that back to you. Lord, just start reconciling into my life. And just slowly, he started bringing people back into my life that, that allowed me to reconcile with my family and with other people that I had harmed. Other men in prison that I had harmed. And, and, and one, of the most, one of the most incredible parts of your story, I think it's one of the most beautiful parts, um, You've been forgiven by God. You've been forgiven by Miss Stella's daughter. You, you, you're following Jesus. I'd planned on this weekend before I knew we were going to sit down together on sharing the, the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Yeah. Because when he washes their feet, he says, as I've done for you, you do for others. Yeah. You took feet washing to a whole other <laughs> level. I want you to tell us about Lee Tolbert. Um. So after my weekend, I, um, I started working at a, uh, it was the back dock. Everything came in and out of prison at the back dock. So I would unload trucks and load trucks. And me and Lee worked back there, but I didn't know him at the time. Uh, he wasn't saved at the time. Um, he was an African-American brother from the inner city of Toledo. Uh, we had more in common than, than I would have ever guessed I ever had in common with someone like that. And uh, he was the youngest of eight. Uh, came to prison at 17 for taking a life. Um, but he shared with me after we became friends that on the back dock, I was, I was ministering. I was discipling. I was doing what I was called to do. And uh, so I would be, I, I would be praying with, with 
black brothers, with Latino brothers, with, I mean, everybody. And I would be sharing the word. I would, and, and Lee said he would be sitting over in the corner and he'd see this white guy with all these swastika tattoos and all these lightning bolt tattoos and all this stuff. And he said he would see me hugging other races and praying and sharing the word. And he said he, he was so confused. He said, but he was drawn to it. And uh, me and him started talking and before long we became friends and before long I was able to uh, uh, sponsor him for a Kairos weekend. And then on his Kairos weekend, he accepted Christ. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and the two of you, you, you work together, you're, you're, you're best friends, you're sharing everything together. Yeah. You're, Inseparable. You're, you're, you're a yeah. part of Promise Keepers events yeah. in prison. You're doing all, all of this together. And then yeah. he gets sick. Yeah. In 2014, um, he uh, was diagnosed with fourth stage prostate cancer. Uh, he started complaining about a year before that, that um, that his back hurt and, and, and they started diagnosing him with different stuff. And, and before long, he was diagnosed with fourth stage prostate cancer, but it had spread into other parts of him. Um, so he was in uh, a lot of pain and I, uh, in that first year, that first process, I go to the parole board and, and I get another five-year continuance and, and I'm mad at God and, and it's okay because, you know, our father, he has, he has broad shoulders and he doesn't mind if you get mad at him. Uh, he knows what's going on and, and I don't understand. I don't see what's going on in the back, what, what's going on, but, and I, I know one of the things that God had me there for was... Uh, was to help Lee because I know that every bad thing that I had done in my life brought me to this point, brought me to this point to set all of that stuff aside. And I was given the chance to be his caretaker. Because without someone there to help him as he needed, he would have had to sit in a, in a prison hospital bed, sh shackled to the bed, even though he couldn't walk, even though he couldn't go anywhere, and he would have died there alone. So in all of that, uh, so we're, t we're walking, uh, uh, I'm getting up every morning, uh, going to pill call with him, going, going to his doctor's appointments with him, walking him down the hallway to and from. Uh, he, he got to a point where he couldn't um, uh, hold his bowel movements, uh, so he had to wear uh, adult depends. And, and uh, so I would get up every morning at 5.30, and, and I would go help him. I would clean him up. I would... I would uh, and let him keep his dignity, let him keep his pride. Because everything else has been taken from him, his mom, his dad, his future, his, his freedom, all that stuff. But one thing that, that Lee had, Lee had a love for God like, like nobody I had ever met. And, and when he came to Christ, he was different. And as we're walking through this, uh, man, it, it was just, it was, I would have my down days and, and he'd bring me up and, and he would have his down days and, and I would bring him up. And, and one morning and uh, I would go down and, and Lee was usually setting up by the time I got down there. And this time he was still laying down and and when that happened, I knew it was going to be a bad day, a bad day for him. Now, this is my brother. This is a brother that, that I had grown so close with that uh, he was my, my flesh and bone. He was, he was closer than any other family member I had ever known. 
So I, I kind of rub his back and, and I set him up and, and I'm like, are you okay? And he's like, you know, he would lie on a regular. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. You know, <laughs> he was a bad liar. <laughs> So, I'm, so he's taking a lot of uh, steroids, uh, so he had gained a lot of weight. So he was probably 350 pounds, 375 pounds at this point, 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, uh, so I, I, I got him up so he could stand and lean up on the top bed. And, and uh, I would pull his shorts down and pull... pull his adult diapers down and, and, and I would grab some rags and I was cleaning him off and I'm on my knees. <laughs> Lee had an awesome sense of humor and he would, he would hit it right at those right moments that would just, any kind of tension or anything in the air was gone. He looked down at me and I looked up at him and, you know, his... his his extremities is right here in my face. And, and, and he just said, if your Aryan brothers could see you now. <laughs> Stan, they can see you now. They can see you now. Chad, that better. was the last day I got to see him because I had to sit him on the toilet and, uh, and his eyes rolled back in his head. And, and uh, one thing that me and my wife had promised him that he wouldn't die alone. So they took him to the hospital. And my wife started to go into the visit to make sure that he wouldn't die alone, to make sure he still felt the love of Christ to the very end. Mm. I'm so thankful for my time with him. And I'm thankful Come on. for my wife stepping up and showing Christ's love to him. Because nobody in the free world can understand how lonely it is in prison. No one can. Well, I know there are, Stan, literally thousands of men and women behind bars today that see you, that are right here with us. I want to talk about one. Let's talk about Jeff. <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> a few months ago, you thought I might have been talking about you. Now you know, Jeff. I know you're watching right now. I'm talking about you. Stan, you'd been doing ministry for years in prison. You'd done chapel services. You're mentoring men. Then COVID happens. Yeah. Everything gets shut down. You're not able to worship alongside your brothers anymore. That's when you're introduced to Rock City. Yeah. And as are many of the men around you, talk about that moment and tell us a little bit of Jeff's story. Uh, so, uh, my wife introduced me to it. Uh, she said, Hey, there's this church on TV at, at, on channel six, you need to tune in. So we started watching it and, uh, we would talk about it afterwards, talking about the sermons and, and, and the word that was shared. And before long, other men were tuning in, uh, because at that point, Chad, there was no worship service in prison. You had nothing. So the brothers inside were so hungry to hear the God, word of God. And it was so refreshing to be able to, man, hear the, your worship team is awesome, man. It is, man. It's, ah, oh, man. You could just, and that's the part that would draw a lot of the men in at first was you could just feel the spirit of God through those worship songs. And uh, me and my celly at that time, uh, Donnie, uh, we, would, we, would, we would talk about it. Uh, we would go down to the tables and, and other, other brothers would, would talk about 
Rock City and, and the service and, and what we had heard. And, and I'm watching it one day and you're, you're sharing. Well, a week before this, Jeff, who sailed right next to me, uh, he talks to me about tithing. And I don't, I'm not sure when he came to Christ or when he decided that in his life. Uh, people are real private in prison. And, um, but he came over and he said, hey, he said, how do you tithe? He said, I want to start tithing to Rock City. And so I explained it to him. He had to fill out a cash slip and this and that. And in the very next week, you're talking about a, a man that, from prison by the name of Jeff that was tithing to prison, that, that was tithing to Rock City. And he came over and he said, hey. He said, I haven't even sent it out yet. Come on, man. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> He's like, he's talking about me, but he can't <laughs> yeah. be talking about me. Yeah, right. But you were going through, a, Rock City was going through a, uh, a time of fasting. And um, he came over to me and he said, man, how do you fast? Mm. How, do you, how do you do this fasting mm. stuff? And, and they said they had some stuff online, but we can't get anything online. So I kind of explained it to him, but... Right after that, I, I speak with my wife and I said, hey, can you print this stuff off, on the, off of the computer and send it in to me? Uh, I'll get some copies and I'll pass it out. So I did that and, and he started fasting on, with man. you guys. And so uh, awesome. man, uh, the hunger for God in there is, hmm. is so strong. And the brothers in there that are, man, there's warriors in there for Christ, yeah. man. There's warriors in there, Cordell and, and Chris and... Come on. And Jeff, Jeff makes you something. We don't, we don't have time to tell the whole story. Right. But I do want you to show this because when you, when you first confessed Christ as Lord and Savior, it was in front of a podium in prison. Yep. This cross was in the front of the podium. Yep. They'd thrown out the, the podium. Yeah. Weeks before you were released, yep. you saw it, pulled it out. And when you were paroled, Jeff made you this frame yeah. with the cross yep. that you first... <laughs> Profess Christ as Savior. Yeah. Jeff, I want you to see this. How, how awesome. Tell us that this, when you were given parole, what was that like for you? <laughs> 33 years in prison, never feeling as though you'll ever be released. What was, what was that parole like for you? I had come to terms, me and my wife had come to terms that I'd never get out of prison. Matthew 6.33, I, I, I put that in my heart. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And that's what I started doing. I'm going to serve him no matter where I'm at. So I'm in prison, so serve him. Uh, when, when, when they said that they were granting me a parole, it was as if God, and I had heard you say it um, uh, in one of your sermons, uh, well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs> And that's what I felt. I felt like I was being rewarded by God because I had thrown freedom out. I had thrown the world out and I had accepted wherever he has me, I'm going to serve him. And that's what I decided. And when they gave me that, I, um, it was unreal. Setting up here is, is still unreal to me. It's kind of like a dream. And I, man, I, Chad, I just want, Man, I want those brothers in there that feel like, or sisters that feel like they're never going to get out of prison. And just serve him. Just, man, renounce the world and do what you do. Yeah. Do what the Word of God tells you to do. And just forget about everything else and sow into men and women's lives. And, man, he's going to reward you. But the rewards of this world is nothing compared to the rewards that we have in heaven. Yeah. Would you... Stan, as, as we bring this to a close, there, there's a particular passage of Scripture yeah. that um, I know you want to read, and I, I think he hearing this from you is, is going to be really special. Would you read 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17? Yeah, thank you. This is a kind of my life verse, and it... it when I first read it, I'm like, wow, he's talking about me. I, uh, 
It says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considers me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that Christ our Lord, Jesus Christ, here is a faithful and trustworthy saying that deserves all acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of all sinners, Christ Jesus, might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 I want to ask you to, to bow your head with me. I think now is a great time to pray together, whether you're in person, close, you're watching from afar, or you're in a prison cell today. The Bible says that we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I want you to think about that. My favorite verse is this. It's Romans 10, 13. Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus Thanks. will be saved. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done or how many times you've counted yourself out. He loves you. He's never counted you out. And everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. So if you want to pray this prayer with me, you want to be forgiven like Stan has been forgiven, would you just say, Jesus, I need you. I trust you. As Lord and Savior of my life, forgive me of all the sin in my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. As I choose to follow you, I receive salvation from you now, and I step into my God-given purpose this moment. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Everybody said. Amen. Amen. Well, come on. Can we give God praise? Can we give God praise? Hallelujah. 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 Stan, I've got just one more thing. I, I, I want to make this quick because we don't have a lot of time, but I have one more thing. I, I um, was speaking with your former warden this week, Miss Money. I know she, when you were paroled, she offered you a job at the nonprofit that she's helping to run called Kind Way. Your job is now to help men and women who are getting out of prison to find employment, a place to live. She wanted to make clear that you were not offered a job out of charity. She said, Stan has been our inside man for as long as we've been an organization. He is a true Saul to Paul miracle. That's what she said about you. She said, I've seen Stan lead more young men to Christ, rescue more young men in prison than anybody. He's the true deal. And she said, we didn't have a position for Stan, but we made one. Because what a waste it would have been to have Stan go out and just work someplace else. He's, he's been our staff person on the inside. He needs to be a part of our team. And I, I thought that, that said so much about you, you, you are too valuable to miss money. You are too valuable to us. You are so valuable to so many. And we can't even get into the fact that you are married and how much God has blessed you. I mean, that's another story for another day. But, but Stan, we want to bless you. And um, Miss Money, we want to bless you. We want to bless the Kind Way organization because the fruit of your ministry and your life's work is, is right here sitting with me today. And so... 
So Stan, on behalf of Rock City Church, we would like to make a donation to Kindway Ministries that will cover your salary and your benefits in full for an entire year. <laughs> Can we do that, church? Come on. Is that okay with you? Is this good today? Has it been good today? Come on, can we make some noise for Jesus? Come on. Can we make some noise for Jesus? Stan, thank you. Come on, can we hear it for Stan, Stever? Come on. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you. You are a brother. You are a friend. You mean the world to me. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for allowing God to use you. Amen. Uh, come on, church, one more time. Put your hands together. Stand, Steve.